Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Disrupting the cow. This interview is about how factory farms, agriculture and land prices will be disrupted by precision fermentation. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! Welcome to another episode of this podcast. Today I'm joined by Catherine Tubb of Rethink X, the lead author of Rethinking Food and Agriculture 2020-2030, the second domestication of plants and animals, the disruption of the cow and the collapse of the industrial livestock farming. Welcome, Catherine. Hi, Kevin. So personal question, what brings you to the space and what brings you to ag and food? So after my PhD, I actually ended up in finance, looking mainly at the kind of fertilizer, crop protection chemicals and seed companies. And part of that work, we looked at very, the global very fun trends. Space, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, um, it is fun, but probably not for the reasons. And and just kind of the feed that we're looking at many things, including the feed the world theme. And I just got really interested in the whole agriculture space there, mainly really from a data point of view. It felt a very opaque industry. So after I kind of moved on in my firm, I was always maintaining kind of this interest in the agricultural space, but. The job came up at Rethink X and I really felt it kind of married my interest in the agricultural space along with a kind of data driven approach to that. And then also perhaps doing something, you know, scratching the itch to do something that I had with a bit more impact as well. Yeah, I mean, can you, for whoever didn't read the report yet, I definitely encourage you to do so. I will link um, all the links to the report, which is freely online available. Uh, disrupting the cow a subtitle i think is enough to to make you read it but can you give us a short overview of what you mean with a precision fermentation and how that uh, is gonna disrupt in the next decade basically because we're almost in 2020 especially as you focus on uh, on the us and uh, the factory farming industry yeah so our report looks at how technology is going to converge and basically become cheap enough and good enough to transform how we produce protein so this report is really about a protein disruption driven by economics and essentially we're going to be able to produce these same proteins found today in livestock by a method we call precision fermentation and by 2025 this te technology will be able to compete cost-wise with bulk proteins and that this is the point where adoption is going to be able to tip and accelerate exponentially and all that time cost are going to continue to improve and ultimately we see proteins as being five times cheaper by 2030 than existing animal proteins and i guess the other point is not a single disruption but multiple parallel disruptions across every single part of the cow from the milk the meat the leather the collagen and these are all going to impact each other and it doesn't depend on a kind of one-for-one -one substitution of the end product this is an ingredient business to business led disruption yeah because i think that's a absolutely crucial point that it, it's not yeah. disrupting the cow as a whole it's very similar to a report rethink wrote before about oil exactly it's looking at all the different parts and which one is going first and probably taking away the business model actually for most cow farming as it is very very thin margins can you explain a bit more about how that that whole picture works in terms of when we look at a cow and how that's being processed today and how that might be partly replaced um, as in a, a roadmap over the next five to ten years 
Yeah, so the best example of this is really milk. So if you think about, if you take milk from a cow, only 3.3% of it is the protein. And I think another couple of percent is the fat. And if you think about how milk is actually used globally, a lot of the milk is actually kind of put down into the solids, the milk solids, and that's what's exported. So for example, New Zealand exports 70% of their milk as these solid exports. If you can make that at the same cost <laughs> anywhere in the world, that's going to completely obliterate New Zealand's export milk industry and therefore obliterate their dairy industry. And that's going to obviously have huge knock-on effects then once you take out the dairy industry, you take out kind of cheap meat and that's going to increase prices in the meat and then that's going to kind of drive investment and um, into the further kind of PF for precision fermentation for meat, then that's going to kind of basically disrupt the whole cow. So this is what we mean when it's not this one for one disruption. You don't have to be able to make like the same amount of meat or the same amount of milk. You can just make those parts. It's this, we call it a food as software model. So you're just building up from the bottom of our food system, essentially. And it seems a very fragile system and almost a domino effect. Like if you take out one, and the whole thing will qu very quickly, because that's what you're writing about, the disruption will very quickly collapse. Exactly. So I mean, I th particularly the, the cow industry is very on very operating on very thin margins, as I'm sure people are aware, there's a lot of subsidies going on. So it's kind of very knife edge industry, and that makes it very kind of susceptible to disruption. And that's something we've looked at, as you mentioned, our previous report. And this is kind of our bread and butter. This is what we look at. We look at disruptions, technology driven disruptions. So this is something we feel particularly confident about. And can you describe, because for sure, a few people now think, OK, what is this PF precision fermentation? <laughs> what, what is it exactly? How should I imagine a factory looks, looking like? How should I imagine these proteins being created? So precision fermentation is when you take microbes and basically kind of program them to produce anything you want, and mainly proteins, right? So things like yeast, fungi, you'll be able to just program just as we do. It's fermentation, just as you, you do to make beer or sugar or kimchi or ketchup or wine or yogurt. You know, you're going to harness these microbes to be able to make any protein you want. So if you imagine a farm, it could look very like a kind of local craft brewery with lots of tanks going on, making these proteins that are going to be used. So, of course, as that, it could be anywhere in the world, right? You're not limited to kind of this centralised production system. It, these tanks could be in your back garden or in the, the car park of a supermarket. You know, it could be anywhere on, on a rooftop. And what does it use as feed? Because these microbes need to eat. So what do we need to feed them basically to create these proteins? It's mainly sugar and then nitrogen. Um, sugar from anything, we eventually think that you'll, they'll be able to get carbohydrates from kind of biomatter. So, you know, even leaves or household waste in the end. But you just need a lot less of it than you do currently for the current livestock system. So if the livestock, if you imagine a cow, it's like a 25 to 1 roughly. I mean, you hear any, you know, 4% feed of efficient cows, or if you're going to a 1 to 1 feed efficiency, it's just a lot less feed you're going to need. And does the, the quality of the sugar of the material, because I think for now it will be mostly sugar, yeah. um, does that influence the outcome of the protein? Like, is it, as in, as in software, I mean, is it software as a service, like garbage in, garbage out? W what does that do to the microbe if you're feeding X type of sugar or, or is, is there, um, w what's happening on that space? It's a bit like a car, I guess, if, depending on if you're using the right fuel, but it depends on what the car wants to use. I mean, if you put petrol in a diesel car, it's not going to work. If you put diesel in a diesel car, it is. So it depends on how the, the microbe is tuned to take the input. And that's something that you can also program. So you're not just programming the outputs, but you can program the kind of inputs needed as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, I know a lot of microbes at the moment like to kind of bathe in the best possible sugar the purest glucose but that can change it's just an efficiency question and a programmable question and the big question on health like what comes out of this process i think we all know the incredible health issues of the industrial uh, factory farming system and, and what comes out of that I, I i don't think we can even call it meat but what comes out of this Probably it will be a big fight if we can actually call it legally meat. I mean, that, that's for a separate discussion. But in terms of health, what do you see where we're now and where we're like in, in five years uh, compared to the meat products you can now buy in the supermarket or the, the protein products? Because it could be milk, as you said before. I mean, I think there's a d disease and nutrition question on health. So disease, obviously, you're not going to have those kind of 
issues that you get with factory farming and then the slaughterhouses where you get a lot of contamination of the food. So, you know, they've done um, some tests, I think, on this, the meat produced via kind of, which is slightly different to precision fermentation, but if you can produce meat, it usually doesn't get the same bacteria and microbes that you have an issue with. But then on the nutrition side, obviously there is a bigger kind of question and people are still looking into that a lot. Um, but on nutrition, I think the ability to kind of build up the products, you know, very personalizable nutrition questions that you need, like based on the particular proteins that you may or may not need, it's going to be extremely valuable. You know, we definitely say that it's going to be better because you're just not going to have that contamination that you get in the current system. But is it safe to say that, uh, let's say, on the nutrition side of things, there's still, at least I see that in, in let's say, the regular ag and food space, there's still a lot of unknowns on what actually is nutrition and what nurtures us and where that actually comes from. Is that figured out already in, in precision fermentation? Well, you're just producing the same um, protein. So that could be a plant-based protein or an animal-based protein. So for example, the Impossible Burger uses this technology to make heme, but it's heme from a soy plant. So you could do it to make any kind of protein, right? So I think the ability to make these pure proteins would enable us to understand much better the impact that they're going to they're going to have on us. But I wouldn't, yeah, I would definitely agree with you that there are obviously still a lot of questions about nutrition. We're not necessarily trying to answer that here. We're just saying if you can make any protein cheaper than people generally, that's generally how people choose their food, right? It's actually based on taste, cost and convenience. Nutrition is becoming increasingly important to people, but that's not the main driver. And you mentioned a few times in the report, actually, hormones. I mean, we know the hormone story on the, the CAFO side of things. How is that in precision fermentation? I want to. I keep saying precision farming because I see the F, but it's actually pre precision <laughs> fermentation. It's. It's a. I'm, I'm gonna mess up a few times in this podcast, probably. Yeah, I mean, you're not gonna need any hormone inputs, right? This is gonna be a closed system, telling the yeast, giving them sugar to produce a protein. There is no other kind of impacts. How you then use that protein, whether it's to make meat further on, or, you know, to make up a kind of plant plus, you know, precision fermentation burger food or milk wouldn't have any hormones in, you're just not gonna have those excess hormones at all. So I think that's an incredibly, that on the nutrition or health side, that's obviously a really good benefit. And I mean, you mentioned you could have these plants or these fermentation fats basically anywhere, like microbreweries, etc. How, how do we prevent that we have the same kind of concentration? Because they, they sound like quite big investments in terms of infrastructure, especially at the beginning, of course, prices will come down, but to really build up this huge fermentation industry that, that will give us a lot of uh, animal protein. How do we prevent this enormous concentration that we have now, especially in the, the CAFO industry in the US, where I think there are just a few producing all pork and just a few producing all chickens, and they're actually mostly the same companies. And also in, in the beef industry, there's an enormous concentration. Is there anything to say on that as a potential danger and, and what this movement could do for that? Yeah, so this is really part of the point of our report, right? We want to kind of alert people that there are going to be choices to be made with this technology disruption. And we really kind of advocate to ensure an open, transparent, competitive market, you know, because we think that's critical to ensure competition. And there are going to be kind of key choices to be made around IP to prevent that oligopoly type structure. So I think the food of software model being distributed is kind of aligned a little bit with meaning that you're not going to necessarily see those big kind of oligopolies because the molecule development, microorganism design, distribution and food production is much closer to kind of craft brewing industry. And then because it's distributed, it means it's going to be very hard for any one company to kind of dominate and difficult for those companies kind of providing a lesser quality product to succeed as well. So you get the kind of the benefit of the distribution also adding to kind of higher quality. So really, we advocate to allow companies patent production, but not of life or genes or molecules, but perhaps around process rather than output focused. And then also avoid following the pharmaceutical model where, you know, hopefully it should actually be the cost of the product development is much lower than pharmaceuticals as well. And then just kind of supporting globally this creation, an open source, transparent, collaborative network, which should be international to really just accelerate the pace of development. But you're right, there are a lot of questions and, you know, things to put in place that we do avoid that big oligopoly structure. Yeah, because it tends to go there, unfortunately, um, even with now microbreweries being bought up by the big ones that see that there's their margins and the market is changing there. But at least for a while it was very, and it is still very distributed and, and 
I mean, if they can get into protein at some point and the fermentation isn't so hard and difficult to control, which I don't know, it should hopefully prevent that. But it's going to, I mean, it's, it's also a plea for governments to get involved and set certain structures and rules around this, because otherwise it will follow the model we've unfortunately seen before. Yeah, I mean, I think you're always going to have big food companies in play because they are they do have those kind of networks and distribution now. And if, say, a Nestle or someone decided to take this technology and integrate it into their system, they would kind of be a good place to do it. But it may well, you know, they could then take it all in house. But equally, they may say, actually, we're just going to go to localised production and perhaps the production becomes, you know, not a few farms. It's actually done locally and closer to where Nestle's customers are, for example. So you're kind of wiping out all that distribution that you need. So, I mean, there are a few models that could happen and it will depend a lot on the incumbents and how they act as much as how these new um, companies come along as well. Yeah. And if you would name like one or two examples that surprised you most in a report or something that came out that was actually closer to our food shelves than maybe five to 10 years uh, what would you say? I mean, I have one that I, I got, which was, was very interesting, but I would, I'm curious about how, how close are we actually already to this and what surprised you in that? I mean, we are. this is already here, right? I'm impossible have already producing these products. Um, I think I'm mo- most excited about some of the products because we're kind of in terms of the cost curve, just really on the cusp of becoming really cost competitive with bulk proteins. But the ones I'm really excited about that I think are kind of driving forward are more actually in the material space. And the Geltor make collagen for use in pharmaceutical, uh, for use in cosmetics. Um, and apparently it actually can reverse sun damage because you're making human collagen. You're not making, uh, you know, pig or oh, wow. cow collagen or using marine collagen. So you're actually making, you know, it's a very good example because you're making something that's better, right? You're making something that we should be putting on our faces and they've actually just signed i think in the last month few couple of weeks assigned an agreement to make gelatin which is collagen's kind of um, you know one step on which is used obviously in a lot of kind of food sweet supplements so you know that's amazing essentially you can make exa- and obviously there are a lot of kind of gelatin like products that people use to mimic gelatin in using the kind of vegetarian and vegan food space but you know if you can actually make pure gelatin and then whether it's human gelatin or some other gelatin you know it's you're making the best protein that we could be consuming. So I think that to me is like a sign that it's starting to really become competitive. You've seen also companies making spider silk, which is also a protein, and they're making it spider. It's called a Japanese company and they make it into material. Right. So it's not just in food. You're seeing these kind of developments that are really on the market. And that's just, you know, one order of magnitude away in terms of the cost. So I think once you've seen those companies, which you are already with Geltor and Gelatin, moving into the food space that's when it becomes really exciting because obviously you've got to fall down that value cost curve and with food it's quite difficult because meat is really very very cheap you know we're very i don't know lucky i don't know if that's the right word and you know the whole movement has been towards making cheap meat so it's quite hard to break into so i think once we start seeing kind of these products being produced and really breaking into specific areas of the market i think that's when it becomes really exciting yeah you're basically unpacking the cow or the products coming out of the cow and taking obviously the most interesting ones first and that's not uh, the the meat part and i mean another exciting well uh, another interesting example which i probably find as a mother more than anyone is the fact that the idea that for formula milk for babies instead of using kind of cow proteins you could use human proteins right which m- might sound a little bit icky i guess in some ways but if you had the choice you know and everyone has a choice of how they feed their baby but if you decided to feed them formula milk would you prefer them to have formula milk with human proteins or cow proteins you know would it would you like it to be more personalized to your baby or the other way around so i think there's interesting levels where actually you can offer something better for people a superior protein product for people yeah and i was actually i mean that that raises a a lot of interesting questions uh, which we could probably feel (laughs) can fill a whole podcast on that and i will will for sure get responses but that's for another time uh dear listeners um another one i was i was (laughs) Actually surprised by it was palm oil. Like it's already can already be produced via PF at a lower cost than tree produced palm oil. Can you expand a bit on that? Because that would revolutionize, especially deforestation rates that are just going up basically. Yeah. So, I mean, you're not just limited to proteins. You can make other products and one of them is palm oil. There's actually a guy in Bath in the UK working on that. 
I don't know if it's actually a lower cost yet. I, that's not something I'm aware of. Or wanna, but, you know, the idea that you're not limited to just protein, it's any molecule, right? So it's really harnessing these microbes to the full abilities of what they can do and what they can make. So, I mean, you can make anything, pretty much any molecule. I mean, obviously the ones it sees, you know, you make at the moment, a lot of biological drugs are made this way. But as we go down the cost curve, it's going to really open up kind of smaller molecules as well. So protein is probably the next level, I would say, kind of, you know, you're not going to make necessary commodity chemicals like this until the cost really comes down. But yeah, anything like vanilla, there's just been a signed agreement with a company that making vanilla. So there's a big, um, I don't know how much you know about vanilla, but actually 99% of vanilla is not made it's not natural in inverted commas it's actually made from wood or oil Mm -hmm. but and it's not quite vanilla vanilla is the actual kind of molecule but yeah exactly it's not quite the real vanilla but actually you can harness these microbes to make the actual vanilla that comes from a vanilla plant and obviously vanilla itself natural vanilla is is very intensive in terms of land time effort you know it's quite um, a difficult crop so if you can make the exact molecule this way, which is obviously better than from oil, then that's quite attractive. And a lot of flavors and fragrances are made, already made, that can be made like this as well. And I mean, we've been looking at the, the consumer or our side of the equation. What does this mean for, because you specifically looked at factory farms in uh, the US, what does this mean for, let's say, the farmers and the workers in these industries? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's hugely disruptive. And again, you know, we're not... I don't want to soften this as in it, if what we say is true, then essentially, you know, there'll be millions of jobs lost because essentially of factory farmers, we know it won't exist. And just to just to put it, you're predicting by 2025 and 2030, what numbers uh, in drops? So 2030, it's about a million, I think, uh, workers are going to be fewer in the US will be impacted directly from this disruption however we also anticipate there could be an extra million jobs created (laughs) if you know the US really takes on board this just you know takes on board and and becomes the leader right because part of this is this disruption is coming whether the US or anyone resists it or not and there's not going to be any geographical barriers to it so if the US say resists or fails to support it then other countries will just step in and capture the wealth and jobs and health bank benefits so it's really a question here of whether the US can kind of step in and capture or any country can kind of capture the extraordinary value that's going to be created. So it's much better to be at the beginning of a disruption than the end because you don't capture those kind of intellectual benefits. So that's what we really kind of advocate for. We say, look, this disruption is coming and it's inevitable and you need to get on top of this and think about how you can support the farmers and workers. Because we always say support, you know, support workers, not jobs. So it's about supporting the people that might be affected rather than trying to protect the jobs. And what does this mean for the farmers that are actually mostly growing, if you look on average in the US, crops for animals? So what does this mean for rural, rural America? Yeah, I mean, there are huge impacts. We, I think we forecast something like almost 500 million um, acres of land will not be needed in the way that it is now to produce crops. So it's going to create these huge opportunities for farmers. I mean, obviously, there's massive impacts such as land values could be decimated, right? They're going to be disproportionately affected by this impact. It's probably a likely a rapid collapse in value, but you know which is something investors should take notice yeah. of because a lot of their models are based actually on uh, land always has uh, like their real assets they always have value exactly and um, you know we've seen a precedent for that land drop as well and um, value drop by more than 50 percent i think in the 20s and 30s and then also another 40 percent in the 80s so this has happened so you can see a kind of disproportionate effect of land values but then in terms of the farms themselves i think I know in the US, there's, you know, actually a lot of if you take out the cafes, many of the farms are actually more kind of across many different crops and products. And is there kind of a opportunity, I guess, to kind of switch the type of crops they use or go to a more agential farming model? There's a lot of choices to be made or go to crops that perhaps, you know, are needed because there'll be other crops that are needed to support this disruption and also to kind of support just consumer changes in food as well. So I think there's still going to be crops needed, but it might require farmers to think about what they're cropping and move from this monocropping culture a little bit. 
And that's ultimately better for the land. But these are all choices that we need to be made. Perhaps there's even choices to use the land for national parks or for solar panels, for wilderness, commercial industrial development. There's kind of a lot of other choices just even outside of farming. Yeah, you mentioned an interesting option in the report that the artisanal meat production let's hope they're mostly regenerative, but let's, let's call them artisanal <laughs> for now, that probably in terms of price point, they will actually be, it will be easier for them to compete as the meat prices will go up as the more profitable parts of the cow get disrupted first. So maybe uh, the regenerative farmers listening to this podcast will actually find themselves in a, in a position where it's actually easier to compete as meat prices of uh, factory farm meat has, uh, will rise over the next years. And obviously they, the regenerative farmers still have their uh, ecosystem services and and maybe this is actually a way to approach the discussion should we eat animals or not or what's the role of animals in uh, the landscape and i think it's a separate discussion the one should we eat animals or not which will resolve over the next uh, years uh, but there is a role is there a role for animals in landscape restoration is there an, a role for animals in, in soil regeneration uh, which then suddenly becomes a whole different discussion if the meat if the pressure on the meat industry or producing the cheapest way possible is taken away. Yeah, I, and w something we've looked at in the report or looked at as part of our report, I don't know how much we can't, we touch on it a little bit, is the idea that how we have used a cow has changed so much from 10,000 years ago, and even 100 years ago. 100 years ago, a cow represented labour, energy, fertiliser, food storage, food value. You used to give them as dowries, I and mean, we're still doing some of the world, but you know, the whole the cow is really a every part of the cow would be used right it'd be used for tools and the bones would be used everything would be used and we've moved away from that really and it's probably even the last 10 20 years that we just now really really there are areas only use the cow for meat we obviously do use leather and dairy as well but the you know eat a cow is not used for the whole the sum of its parts anymore it's really just used for one thing and there is definitely a role for the idea that if you can basically go back to a, a and time when the cow is being used as its whole rather than just for meat, it becomes a much more useful part of the environment. And so we're not saying, look, the cow is bad or the cow is good. We're just saying, look, how the cow as a technology to produce food has had its time. And there's going to be a technology that's going to come in and it's going to be better and cheaper and it's going to be replaced. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there's never going to be cows again, but it's like, well, what is the role? I guess there's some existential questions, but what is the role of a cow, right? So, you know, to be had by people. But, you know, we try not to talk about it in terms of the cow being good or bad. We are saying, look, this is just a technology that's going to be disrupted and that's going to have implications. No, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think the, the holistic view often gets missed, especially as we go to one single solution. In this case, cow equals meat or equals a lot of yeah. products and, and not paying any attention of what role has the cow before that, uh, which, I mean, like you mentioned, was energy, etc. Not Not that we need to go back to putting cows in front of a plow, no, but, but there is something to learn there, uh, especially on the higher level. Yeah, and the cow has been disrupted before, right? You know, the, the refrigerator arguably disrupted the point of storage of food in a cow. <laughs> you know, you can now raise a cow and just basically convert it to meat in the quickest amount of time. You don't have to worry about storing the food, you know. There's, so I think we just, it is, it, we do need to move away a little bit and just think about that this is almost the final disruption, which also makes it inevitable in our view and this is why it's going to happen and in terms for investors listening to to this they might have positions in the space they, they they are very interested in soil they're very interested in food what would you tell them apart from reading the report uh, what would you tell them obviously not giving investment advice but what to look out for what to watch out for um, let's say over the next 10 years as this revolution is uh, is coming or this disruption is coming is happening yeah and um, so i mean for, for investors it's it i mean i think that we touched on like land values a little bit you know about how you know they could be disproportionately affected so if you're kind of invested in areas of land perhaps have a look i would say the one thing is i know i've mentioned it before that this is an in inevitable thing so it's really about positioning themselves how do they take advantage of the upside but mitigate the downside risk and we kind of do think about disruption as being there's an, you know, the disruption is going to happen to the cow. So everything around the cow is going to be particularly impacted. And then perhaps as you get out, like as you move away from the cow in the distribution and supply chain, it's maybe less impacted. So I guess it's about positioning themselves if they believe that this disruption is happening in order to kind of allow their portfolio to accept that. And 
what could go wrong in a sense of you're saying it's absolutely inevitable, um, but what's the least likely scenario? Is it going to go a lot slower? Is it going to be all taken up by the huge meat companies? What, what do you fear in terms of uh, uh, this disruption? I think, yeah, I mean, it could be slower, right? I think there can always be bits on the things that could impact how fast some of this technology improves. Even if we're like two or three years out or even five, I would argue it doesn't make us wrong. <laughs> it's probably still happening a lot quicker than people expect. And then I guess the adoption in terms of the investment and supply scale up. We have seen examples of scale up happening extremely quickly, for example, in bioethanol fuels. So we are we do believe that it can happen very quickly, but it may just take a bit longer than we expect that we have in our in our estimates. But as I said, I still think it's inevitable. It's just like, does it happen in 2030 or 2035? The other kind of pattern we often see in um, disruptions is often the old industry has a price spike before it kind of collapses so we may actually see a kind of and that's often to do just with a mismatch of supply and demand so we've seen it with the coal industry as well you know you had peak before you had the trough and um, we've seen it with kodak had like peak sales before they basically collapsed um, because of digital film and so we may well see peak prices so i think even if you see the high prices in meat over the next few years i wouldn't necessarily dismiss this theory i would just say it actually adds weight to it in some ways but I would say, yeah. So uh, can you explain that a bit? How, how does that work? Um, how could it play out in uh, in meat production? Would there be higher prices in the supermarkets or higher stock prices of these CAFO operators or CAFO companies? Or very good, win uh, very good, uh, let's say, production numbers and, and profits uh, announced by them? Yeah, exactly. So you may well see high, well, higher, higher animal prices or cow prices meat prices basically which wouldn't necessarily mean higher prices higher um, profits for tyson because that's one of their cost of goods sold but would actually almost kind of make tyson perhaps double down and invest in this kind of alternative production so yeah you'd see higher prices for the farmers probably but i don't yeah i mean I, that's something we've seen in a lot of industries so it's definitely kind of almost uh this this peak before the bust idea um but you know, Tyson themselves are investing in these alternatives. So you are seeing, I think, some of the companies themselves are actually aware of this disruption or keeping an eye on it. I think there's definitely been lessons learned from previous ones. So um, it'd be interesting to see how they kind of play out, whether if it's something they're actually committed to or whether they're kind of just doing it to keep an eye on the competition. <laughs> And aren't you afraid for the nutrition part of things? I mean, it could be the acceptance of consumers because they might look uh, differently at it, although it's a lot of ingredients uh, we're, we're talking about. But any early scandals or something that, that might slip through some of the filters, etc., could really disrupt this, as we've seen with a lot of new technologies in food. Food is a very touchy, touchy subject, obviously. Yes. Are you scared of any uh, of any of those that, of course, we claim or you claim it's it's going to be exactly the same. Um, but whenever somebody said that, it usually triggers a lot of questions. Uh, do you see any potential anti-disruption from the nutrition side of things? Yeah, I mean, much like parenting, everyone has an opinion on food. So I think, you know, I, it, it, you're right. It's a very, everyone has a very, it's very subjective. Everyone has their own opinion about food and rightly so people choose what they eat, right? Most people are lucky enough to have that choice to choose what they eat. And I'm, we're not trying to tell people what to eat from this disruption. We're not saying you need to. We're just saying this is going to happen. It's going to be ingredients in these products. It's just a change. And we just see it as a shift in the production right, system. So we're just saying it's a technology shift as opposed to kind of a consumer driven shift. But I mean, nutrition wise, I think kind of separately, there are like movements, obviously, about what is the correct nutrition. I am completely confident that this is going to be better. I mean, the one way I think that there's been a bit of a move, I think, at the moment, with the idea of well, what's in meat, right? So what's actually in the food or the food we eat. So I think there has to be transparency, not only in kind of this technology, and we do advocate for that and nutritionally for the food. And I think it will be over. It has to have this regulation around it. It should have this regulation around it. And there should be regulation in that, but also in the current industries and they should match up. So I think that would be that's my view of how I think, you know, these these technologies need to be it needs to be seen on a like for like basis across the whole food system. I mean, there is just to be, you know, to be very um, uh, transparent that the, a lot of these molecules would be um, programmed. And when I say program, I mean, they would use biotechnology. So gene editing. And obviously, in some regions of the world, they don't approve that. So there are 
you know, there, there are perhaps some kind of areas where just even how we define biotechnology needs to be looked at from a regulatory point of view. And I know, for example, Heme from Impossible has had some backlash as well of is it safe, is it healthy? So, you know, I think that that discussion needs to carry on because it's really important. And there may be some proteins, you know, the technology itself, I think, is fine. It's just like the products they produce from it. So some proteins may or may not be good, but that doesn't make the technology bad. So I think, you know, time will tell in terms of what's produced and how we produce it. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of discussion. I mean, I see a lot of pushback on Impossible Burger for choosing GMO seeds and the glyphosate that comes with that. And actually Impossible both of when you take them apart nutritionally, there are a lot of questions on the recipe and the level of salt <laughs> and the level of, and, and you see, especially people in the region X, they say, yeah, this is not a replacement. Of course, you have to look at what it actually replaces in terms of a hamburger, which probably comes for sure from a factory farm. And like yeah. you said, we don't know what's in that. And probably if we don't want to, we should, but we don't want to. But if you compare it with, like you mentioned, artisanal grown or regenerative grown, it, it becomes a whole different discussion. But 99.9% .9 of meat isn't grown like that at the moment. So it's, uh, but exactly. it, it, you get attacked for that because it doesn't seem very healthy if you look at the ingredient list and nutrition depth of it. Yeah, we try not to get into the, I mean, yeah, we try not to get into the discussion of what isn't healthy because that is a very divisive argument. However, we are saying that there's a production system change. We can change how we produce these to make it cheaper. Ultimately, I mean, consumers can change their opinion and we, you know, it, we see this as a software process. So the impossible 2.0 is better than the impossible 1.0 and the impossible 20.0 will be better. <laughs> and when we say better, we mean in every way. So nutritionally, more like meat. So I think there's still, you know, movement to be made. But in terms of, you know, once that's almost a discussion to happen, I guess, once the cow market is completely disrupted as well. Like if we don't even have animal meat anymore, what's the next discussion? <laughs> you know, it probably does become more about kind of health. But again, we're not trying, to, if people don't want to eat an impossible because they don't think it's healthy, that's completely fine. You know, that I, I'm no one is trying to tell anyone what to eat. And the impossible burger themselves, they say they are not trying to disrupt a vegetarian or a vegan. They want to disrupt meat eaters. So that's how they say. Yeah, and especially meat eaters that would traditionally get the CAFO ones and arguably... Any, no, almost anything is better than that. I mean, you don't have to try so hard to, from a nutrition, from an animal welfare and, and from an environmental point of view, it's not so easy exactly. to, to beat that. I want to be conscious of your time and thank you so much for sharing the results of this report, your thinking behind it and what it could mean for the, the egg space in general, but also obviously the, the region egg um, and food space. Very many thanks, Kuhn, and very many thanks to your listeners. I'm always interested and available to hear anyone's opinions and discussions on my email address, uh, food, sorry, food at rethinkx.com. Thank you so much. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, Share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, 
permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning, I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.